before we start, I would like to apologize for every hand that we burned and every hand that we froze. I promise you the pain has not gone in vain. My name is Breno. My name is Ava. I'm Rue. And my name is Gavin. And in this speech, we're going to be discussing how does temperature affect a person's reaction. Now, I came up with this experiment because the day before the EDA project was introduced, I had a soccer practice that was canceled because of freezing precipitation and lightning that was far too close to the fields. So when I went to text my parents to come pick me up early, I found that my hands were so cold, I couldn't do anything with them. And that got me thinking throughout that night and into the next day, how does temperature affect a person's body? Throughout us, our speech, we'll explain some background research we did to gain knowledge about the topic, our expectations and hypothesis for the experiment, our experimental procedure and how we designed the experiment, our results and an analysis of the results, and in the reflection, we'll talk about some real life applications of this experiment in the present and the future. To begin with some background research, according to Kenneth Wright, in a study done by a journal, we found that 14 healthy adults were under normal conditions were tested for their physical performance ability, but at different body temperatures. Looking at the results of this test, we found that lower performance was directly resulted or directly related to the lower body temperature, and higher performance was directly related to a higher body temperature. This gave them their key takeaway that body temperature does have a significant physical or effect on the physical performance and ability of the given person. What do you guys think would happen if we conducted a similar experiment? Now, before we had even any of this background research, we actually had the, a very similar hypothesis that lined up with this data. We concurred that a higher temperature would result in a quicker reaction time, and therefore a lower reaction time would also be linked to a colder temperature. This also brought us into one of our next points, which was the different types of reaction time tests to sort of gauge these results. So the first type of test is symbol time in which a subject is given one stimulus and one, and one task for that. An example of this would be to tell a person to click a button when the light turns on. The next type of a test, which we used in our experiment, is discrimination time. In this test, the subject is given two stimuli, but a task for just one of them. An example of this is what you guys did when you were shown a green screen and a red screen, and were told to click the touchpad on only the green screen. And finally, the third type of test is choice time. In this test, the subject is given again two stimuli, but this time they have a different task for each stimuli. An example of this would be to show them a green screen and a red screen, and to tell them to click the touchpad on the green screen, but to say, clap their hands on the red screen. Now we'll move into some of the expectations and hypothesis for this experiment. We found that looking into some of sort of the more background research, an article titled or by Worthington Biomedical had a similar experiment that we conducted. They also had a graph illustrating some of the effects that temperature has on a reacting or on the reaction time, as you can see here with this graph. The graph will increase, or the reaction time will increase to an optimal temperature where it will abruptly then drop off. Um, this is a non-constant relationship and not lin and non-linear, which is something that we had predicted before looking into this research. We predicted it to look something like the normal distribution, which is something that you guys might have recognized from our math class that we've been looking into recently. You can see that on either side of the midpoint, or on the midline, there is an equal amount of data values and an equal percentage. However, this was not the case with the graph representing this relationship. There were also no numerical values listed in this graph, meaning that we didn't know where room temperature was, and which is why we had to continue our research and look into sort of finding out how much it would vary depending on the temperature change. Moving into our experimental procedure, for this experiment, we decided to test the reaction times of 51 ninth graders at three different temperatures. For the design of this experiment, our control group was room temperature, which is approximately 24 degrees Celsius. Our two treatment groups were hot temperature, approximately 48 degrees Celsius, and cold temperature, zero degrees Celsius. The independent variable in this experiment was exposure time, and the dependent variable was the change in reaction time of our subject. Some of our constants were exposure time and temperature, 
the 51 ninth graders who were our test subjects, and the website we used to test their reaction time. Some of the materials, which you can see over here, include the online reaction time test, a timer, a bucket of ice, a hot water bath, and paper towels. For our procedure, to test the room temperature, we simply asked our subjects to test the reaction time three times and recorded the results. To then test the cold temperature, we had our subjects place their hand in a bucket of ice for 30 seconds and to then dry it off and test the reaction time once. They then put their hand back in the ice for 10 seconds before doing their second trial and did the same thing before the third trial. For the hot temperature, we followed the same procedure we used for the cold temperature. We used a water bath to heat water to 48 degrees Celsius and then had our subjects dip their hands in for 30 seconds. After drying them off, they did their reaction time test once and put their hand back in the water for 10 seconds before doing their second trial and again before doing their third trial. To get the most accurate results, we decided to test each temperature three times, resulting in 153 tests per temperature. Here are some visuals from our experiment. You can also see here on the right hand uh, corner, uh, a video depicting the uh, process in which you'd go about, go about testing someone. You see the red screen, you see them wait for it to turn green, and then you see that blue screen, which is their results after they've pressed their button. And here's our data table that we use to collect our data. Now let's move on to the part four, for the results. As you can see here, there's a graph that is measuring everybody's averages. Now, you can see here the purple, that is the control group, with, that's at room temperature. The blue is representative of the cold exposure, and the red is representative of the hot exposure. Now, on the y-axis, we have the time in milliseconds, and then obviously the x-axis is the uh, control temperatures. Now, average reaction times were about around 335 milliseconds. That time increased by 10 milliseconds when it exposed to the cold temperatures and decreased by 9 uh, milliseconds when exposed to warmer temperatures. We also had some outliers where the opposite was actually true. They were faster when they were exposed to the cold and they were slower when exposed to the warm temperatures. However, because as you can see, these numbers are not very drastic and there were only a few people who had results like this, they did not make a huge impact on our class average. Another fact to note is that we had a smaller sample size of around 51 students, so our margin of error was around 14%. Here's a question for you guys. We handed each of you a strip of paper with your times and your averages listed on them. Write how you think you compared to our class averages and maybe why you thought you had like, times that were slightly different than the averages. Next, we're gonna transition into the reflection, the present and the future. So reflection upon our experiment, it was a success. Our experiment proved that our hypothesis was true, that higher temperature correlates to higher reaction speed and colder temperature to slower reaction speed. Although there were a few improvements that we could have gone about improving our experiment. For example, internal body temperature. Everybody has a slightly different inter internal body temperature and that can affect mobility, which changes how you can, how fast you're going to be able to react. Uh, so obviously that's going to cause some variation in our results. Another thing to consider is the time of day. Acts for Libraries mentioned a study that took people's internal body temperatures throughout the day, and they found that there was a, there was a pattern in variation throughout morning to, uh, to midday to night. And so obviously we tested our peers in second period, but we also tested our peers in third and fourth period. This could cause different um, differences that we could not account for. Another thing that when we're testing people in different periods of the day, we're also testing them in different classrooms. So I'm sure there isn't much of a problem with the temperature in the bio rooms, while we always need a jacket here in the L2K room, and that's the ambient temperature fluctuations. Then we also have the temperature in the water bath. We try to keep the temperature in the water bath at around 48 degrees Celsius, but every time we open the lid, the water gets cooler, and since there's no therm thermometer, we have to wait for the thermometer to get to the right temperature, it takes a while in between people, and we don't have that kind of time. So maybe within a degree Celsius of the 48 degrees. And then we also have the too hot or too cold. Certain people might be sensitive to hot water, and some people might be sensitive to cold ice, and they, that might cause them to retract their hand 
which might cause a little bit of fluctuations in their numbers. Another thing to mention is external stressors. Everybody's life is different and that can impact their body and mental uh, state. So imagine it's second period, you had no sleep last night, you're so, so tired. You're not going to have a very fast reaction time. However, let's say we're testing you and it is fourth period. You just got yelled at by a teacher and now you're extra shaky, you're on edge. Maybe you click it too soon. These can all impact your reaction time. Next, moving into the present. What are the real life applications? Well, the first thing you can think of is the athletics. You think about running on a track. The track gets too hot, your feet get too hot, and you gotta run faster. Then if you look at the pool, if you're in the pool, if you're doing aquatics, if you're swimming, diving, or water polo, the colder water might affect your reaction time and your performance. Next, we also have health. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the debate between taking cold showers and hot showers. Each of them have their own different set of benefits. Cold showers include potentially weight loss because the carbohydrates in your body are used to increase and raise your internal body temperature. The hot showers may kill harmful bacteria and viruses on your, the surface of your skin. Transitioning into the future, we have cognitive function. Now, for a future experiment, we have thought of measuring cognitive ability over the course of different temperatures. So does temperature affect your cognitive performance? And to address the certain things we could have improved on on our current experiment, we would have the subject in a room with a controlled ambient temperature for extended period of time. So that way their internal body temperature doesn't fluctuate as much. Then it would also be their whole body because it's nice and not just your hand. That way your whole body is being affected and it's not just the, the clicking hand. In conclusion, we went over some background research we did before our experiment to get more knowledge about the topic. We then talked about our expectations and hypothesis for how we thought the experiment would go. Next, we explained our experimental procedure and how we designed the experiment, and we went over the results and analysis of some factors that may have affected the results. And finally, we talked about some real-life applications where this experiment could be used. Here are all our references, and thank you for listening.